Get ready to rock radio. Music you want to hear. Right, we're saying hello again to uh, one of our heroes, and that's uh, Ian Anderson, uh, who's speaking to us today from Switzerland. Hello, Ian. Hello there. Ah, nice to hear your voice. Now, we have chatted a couple of times before, and it's always good to uh, hear your voice, Ian, and uh, catch up on things. Uh, How's the summer been for you? Uh, Have you had any highlights as far as the music goes? Um, Well, highlights for me do not include the the several... Well, perhaps several is over-egging it a bit with maybe the three or four so-called festival dates we play, because I'm not a festival guy. I I don't like being at places with lots of noisy uh, musicians strutting their stuff. So if you like, for me, the the lower points (laughs) that involve doing something other than concerts where we're the only only actors on, because uh, I just enjoy the peace and quiet and the relative ease of just doing concerts where all I have to worry about is what I have to play, but um, doing festivals with no sound checks and technical problems, and um, they're, they're not really for me. So I, I have to say that I, I don't really enjoy that. It's not that it's awful. Once we're on stage and once the sound has settled down and monitor balances have got somewhere in the, uh, the ballpark, two or three songs into the show, it's okay. But it's an overall experience. It's not not for me at all. And uh, I try, you know, I try to do interesting festivals as I do them, things I haven't done before, in places perhaps I haven't played before. And of course, this year that included one in the UK, um, recently at the High Voltage Festival, which you know, I imagine was a, a jolly occasion for all the audience who attended the uh, the three different stages and the many classic and progressive rock bands that we're on. So, you know, it, it, you know, very good event, very good affair, but it's not my kind of way of spending an afternoon back hanging out backstage with a lot of tight-trousered, uh, long-haired, um, and quite often aging uh, um, musicians who, uh, you know, you think they do look a little ridiculous when it's clinging, clinging on to some notion of, uh, of, um, of youth. But there you go. I suppose, Ian, though, you might have had a different view 40 years ago because you've played so many festivals and you would have been one of those. That, that, that's why I hate them so much because my going back to the earliest days of doing them all was so disagreeable. I'm just, don't, I'm, I'm just not a person who enjoys being in crowds of people and hanging out with lots of other musicians. I, my backstage experience is a, is a quiet, civilised dressing, dressing room with working plumbing that I don't have to share with anybody else. And... Um, Time to sit and read, write, do the things that I need to do. But you know, sitting in a porter cabin at the side of a noisy rock stage is yes, it's not your idea of fun, really. Definitely not my idea of fun. I'm I'm a party pooper par excellence. Our festivals I enjoy playing were they're essentially series of concerts rather than multi-act festivals, and there's a distinct difference. And it's a, a festival like the Montreux Jazz Festival. And I'm talking to you from Montreux in Switzerland right now. That, that that's a a series of concerts, um, and so it's like doing any other regular show. You, know, you load in at nine o'clock in the morning, you um, line check at two p.m., you sound check at four p.m., and at seven thirty p.m. the show starts, and you're the only you're the only act on, so you're all, you're all that you have to worry about. Yeah, it's more civilized, isn't it? That kind of a festival is is, is fine. Yeah, yeah. So I enjoy the spirit of that kind of a um, um, jazz festival um, series or a folk festival series. It's just a multi-act festival. You've got to try and squeeze ten acts into a, into a day. That's good. That's, that's good for that, that That's a bit like going to Pontins or Butlins or some <laughs> god awful experience of uh, um, you know, something that feels like a cross between entertainment and a prison camp. Get ready to rock radio. Music you want to hear. Now, now, Ian, you've you've also been. I, I gather you've been recording a special song for the Old Grey Whistle Test this summer. Well, we uh, yeah, we, I went into the Old Grey Whistle Test studios um, with our keyboard player John O'Hara a couple of weeks back, and we, we did a couple of songs for uh, the Old Grey Whistle Test a series of uh, radio shows, which are celebrating that um, uh, 40th anniversary, I believe it is, of, uh, of the Old Grey Whistle Test with Bob Harris still at the helm of a, of a series of radio shows which he's producing and presenting and will feature many of the, the world-renowned artists who began or 
cemented their careers on, the, on that famous BBC Two flagship music programme. And I take it the studio this time was slightly bigger than the broom cupboard, cupboard it was um, back in the day. I believe it was quite a cramped existence, wasn't it, when you played in back in the 70s? Well, I think the Andre was the first I went out from a number of different places, but it, it was simply a relatively small TV studio that... Uh, um, Given there was no audience, I mean, you just had the floor space and you set up and and um, Bob Harris would present the show from the periphery of that performance area. But very in labour charm, it was very rustic, very basic and, and completely unadorned with production value. It, it wasn't slick and smooth like uh, Jules Holland's shows. It was uh, it was very, um, very basic, working on a pretty basic budget. And, but it was the quality of the acts that they had on, and the fact that particularly a lot of the major American acts who made their first appearances in the UK on the old Grey Test, which frankly was about the only outlet available to them. It, that, that's what made it, a, I think, a very important program. It's a chance for British people to see not only homegrown talent, but legendary American acts who um, got their first outing uh, on the British Airwaves. Of course, some of your BBC sessions, not just the Old Grey Whistle Test, they've come out um, separately over the years. Do you remember, Ian, back in the 70s when you were recording for the BBC, did you get much preparation time then? You know, you talk about preparing for a festival, but was it very spontaneous, really? Well, again, you, you, would, uh, you would get in the studio, you would set up, you would have a quick sound check for the people in the control room, and um, you know that might mean running through a song or two, or, and then you would um, you know, probably have... I guess a half hour off, an hour off before you went ahead to record the program. But I mean, particularly with the BBC, it tended to be fairly rushed because things were on a tight schedule, and the availability of studio time and the availability of of, um, of uh, personnel time meant that you had to be pretty quick. I mean, doing John Peel's radio show, for example, I mean, you, you would go in half an hour later, you'd do a quick bit of sound check, and and, and then you then you would record your songs for the show. So it was, uh, you'd be in and out within an hour, <laughs> doing John Peel's show, and maybe in and out in an hour and a half if you were doing the old grey whistle test. Were you generally uh, quite pleased with with your performances for those sessions? Because there probably wasn't lot a lot of time to um, redo anything, and it was quite spontaneous. Yeah, so you would tend to stick to material that was tried and tested, tried and tested, which could perform live on stage, and. And you could rattle off with um, reasonable confidence. So um, in the sessions that we did for John Peel's show, for example, there's a lot of those, well, I thought probably all those live recordings still exist for the BBC and they've appeared on compilation albums and probably bootlegs too over the years. And, um, and you know, they are what they are. They, they were usually recorded back then in 69. They would have been recorded in mono, um, probably... Um, at seven and a half inches per second, uh, quarter inch tape, and so the quality is okay, but not great. And um, I mean, I remember myself when I was got my hands on some of the BBC sessions, and, and they were mono tapes. I had to um, embellish them a little bit to give them some feeling of a stereo, um, just to be more comfortable on an ear that's more used to hearing things as stereo and. Uh, Mono is a bit of a sharp reminder as to how we all used to listen to music, but um, it's a bit like it's a bit like looking at going into a, um, into the Tate Gallery and looking at all the paintings with one eye closed. Mm. Uh, I would say that, that that analogy is is something that really does hold hold good. You know, you I mean you can't enjoy seeing the painting or enjoy listening to music in mono, but the experience of uh, of, of hearing music with both ears. Um, is definitely better. So we, um, we, you know, we, we, we value those old recordings, I think, for their spontaneity and for the fact that they represent a little historical moment. And uh, many actually appeared on BBC recordings in those days, you know, would be probably quite proud of, you know, being part of that peer group whose body of work is still available today. And even if maybe you didn't think you played the best that you ever played or, Maybe the odd bum note slipped in there, but um, you still feel overall pretty good about having, say, been been part of that uh, that era. 
programmed by enthusiasts, not accountants. This is Get Ready to Rock Radio. Now let's talk in a little bit about your forthcoming solo tour. Uh, it starts on the 3rd of September in Shrewsbury. Now, going back to uh, what you were saying at the start of our chat about... Uh, you know, preparing and the venues and you hate festivals. But this must be really nice for you because it's an intimate tour with some great uh, um, locations and uh, venues and you're really playing in a stripped-down format. It's not. It's obviously something you've done before. It's a 13-date acoustic tour. Can you tell us what sort of things we, we have in uh, in store for that? Well, it's really based on um, my experiences over the years of doing live uh, radio and television, particularly in America, where we would just go in, either me on my own or with one other person or with two other people, on very, very rare occasions with the whole band, because that always produced extra problems and you start particularly thinking about anything you do with drums or percussion. So um, most often it was just two or three of us would go into radio and TV and do a little kind of acoustic unplugged thing. And, and this, of course, precedes the time when um, MTV famously cottoned on <coughs> to that idea and gave it the, gave it the uh, series title Unplugged. In fact, Jeff Hotel uh, or a couple of members of us were, um, I think, very, very much one of the first, if not the first, uh, musicians who went into the the uh, newly formed MTV uh, studios in New York and took in a couple of guitars and flute and, and in the middle of an interview we played live and, and they were completely surprised by this. They said, wow, no one ever did this before. This is great. And um, and um, and that, that, I think, kicked off the whole idea of inviting musicians to bring their instruments in and do a song or two and a that um, morphed into the full-blown MTV Unplugged series, which, of course, featured people like Eric Clapton doing legendary performances and uh, people like Nirvana doing not-so-memorable <laughs> performances. <laughs> but, you know, it was a bit of fun. And um, I think MTV were, were, uh, were very pleased to have that input from the artists. They didn't seem to realize they could do that. But, of course, we'd been doing that on early morning radio shows for a while and, and, and to this day it's quite often the case that um, you will do that kind of a stripped down show on American TV or radio but to take it on tour and actually do that and, and construct a whole concert around it was something I've never done before just to, the idea of having three of us so we, we have to play a few different instruments and try to bring together arrangements of classic Jets Hotel material with a few new things and some unlikely um, perhaps uh, relatively forgotten pieces of uh, Jeff Hotel or Ian Anderson repertoire. So it's an opportunity to mix and match and within that framework of, I suppose, more of a, a kind of an evening with or a storytelling kind of concert where, you know, obviously we'll talk about the songs and, and make it a little bit more, as you say, intimate in terms of the audience experience. And, and that, that I think is something I'm looking forward to, simply because I haven't done it as a full-blown live tour before, although recently I did do a whole, you know, I did a concert just with the three of us to try it out a couple of months back just to see how it worked. And when we go into rehearsal um, on uh, Wednesday next week, then um, we'll have three days of, of uh, fine-tuning some of those arrangements and making the final decision about the set list that we're going to play. But, as I say, it's a mixture of classic Jeff Hotel songs and less well-known Jeff Hotel songs, a couple of new songs, and and um, a couple of pieces that um, um, you know, come from the world of classical music as opposed to rather than rock music. Do you ever um, sort of listen to the feedback from fans through your website, perhaps, or a forum, um, you know, for um, people's preferences, or, or do you tend not to do that, Ian, when you prepare a tour like this? Uh, because you probably, you've probably got a good idea of what people like to hear and throw in a few sort of uh, unusual things which, uh, that, you know, that they may have temporarily forgotten about. But uh, what, what guides you in that set list? I always, I always listen to what people have to offer. If they want to make a comment or make a suggestion, then uh, I'm more than happy to hear it, so long as they're not hollering it out from the audience in the middle of a quiet passage of music in, in the middle of a concert. I, I, I don't like 
having someone, some usual, usual drunken person shout out the name of the song we want to hear while I'm in the middle of a quiet bit of a, another song. Yeah. But generally speaking, if people you know, whisper in my ear politely or put it on a you know, some blog on a website, then you know, of course I'm going to pay attention to what people say. I, I like to hear what people's thoughts are. But it doesn't mean necessarily that I'm going to um, follow that through in the, in the sense of incorporating everybody's suggestions because people are so individual. Everybody has their favorite songs or their different uh, preferences in terms of the stylistic elements of the music. So you know, it's good to hear what people have to say, but I'm not necessarily going to incorporate those suggestions. But sometimes I do, and uh, I can think of two or three songs that I'll be playing in September, which are those that were suggested to me by, essentially, by fans. And and that, that, that will happen sometimes. But, you know, if they want to put their, um, their 10p in the jukebox, um, then it's probably going to be a waste of 10p in my <laughs> case, because I'm, I'm not there to have buttons pressed and you know, try to please everybody, which is impossible. You simply can't possibly fulfill the myriad of requests that people offer you and um, you know set lists would, uh, would consist of a couple of hundred songs as I try to take everybody's you know, suggestions into the camp Yeah it's, it sounds like it's going to be a marvellous tour, not least the anecdotes Ian, we always love those Well I shall try and keep them brief and to the point which is something I'm not very good at doing but I'll, I'll certainly try and make sure it will be um, leaves in an orderly fashion and does not miss the last train home and thanks once again, Ian, for talking to Get Ready to Rock and uh, all the best for the tour in September. Very good. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye now.